Good evening and welcome to Hard Fire. I'm your host, Joseph Dobrian, bringing you another half hour of current events and political discussion from a libertarian perspective. My guests this evening are Audrey Capozzi, the Libertarian Party candidate for Suffolk County Treasurer, and Chris Garvey, the Libertarian candidate for Suffolk County District Attorney. Now, uh, Audrey, I'm going to start with you. I'm going to ask you to explain to our audience very basically what the Libertarian Party stands for and then what will be the Libertarian way of being treasurer of Suffolk County. <laughs> well, you said a half hour, Joe. Um, <laughs> well, Libertarians basically believe in um, the American Constitution. I guess I would have to say they believe in what our founding fathers proposed. They believe that people have a right to decide for themselves how to spend their own money. Uh, being, you know, candidate for treasurer, that's my concern. Um, uh, they believe in non-intervention po foreign policy, if you want, you want the whole uh, Megillah of libertarianism. But basically, let you do your thing and I'll do my thing and we leave each other alone. Uh, I'm running for treasurer basically to educate the public that Taxes are too high right now. There's too much money being wasted in government, in schools, and I want to educate the people. I want to focus them on, you know, these kinds of issues and finances, and offer people a choice. Okay. And uh, Chris, uh, same question to you. As um, Suffolk County District Attorney, what's the libertarian way of doing that job, and how would you do it? Well, the libertarian principle, to uh, sum it up a little more. Uh, succinctly is that people should be free to do whatever they want except to initiate force, the threat of force, or fraud against other people or their property. And so uh, the district attorney's job, as far as I'm concerned, is, uh, is to stop people from using force or uh, fraud, uh, the threat of force is tantamount to force, against other people or their property. And I've heard of people actually going out and using fraud to steal people's houses. Um, fraudulently uh, creating documents that uh, created mortgages that uh, were never contracted for by the owner simply by using uh, the person's identity. So this is the sort of thing that's going to be my top priority. And of course there's violence. Uh, there are drug gangs. It's not the drugs that concern me as a libertarian, but the fact that they use violence to enforce their territories and to do business as a, a way of doing business. Okay, now that brings up another interesting point, and that is that um, there are certain laws, certain prohibitions that libertarians disapprove of. Uh, now, are you, as district attorney, going to give those laws very low priority or just not enforce it, them? It would be a matter of priority because, in theory, the uh, district attorney is supposed to enforce the laws. In practice, of course, with all the thousands and thousands of laws we have in this country, it's impossible to enforce them all. Uh, and my, my father always... Uh, says to thank God that we don't get all the government we pay for and, and, and we can be equally thankful we don't get all the law enforcement we pay for. Uh, but uh, there's got to be priorities and uh, the priority is going to be force fraud uh, against people and their property. Okay, now uh, speaking of law, Audrey, um, you were uh, telling us before the show about the difficulty of getting on the ballot. Uh, just from a legal perspective, you've got to jump through an awful lot of hoops. Uh, in the state of New York, what does it take for a third party like the Libertarians to get on the ballot? Well, it depends on um, what position they're running for, Joe. For example, in the towns in New York State, they need 1,500 signatures, and that has to be collected in a six-week period in the height of the summer when people are on vacation and people don't want to really be thinking about things like this. For the county, it's also 1,500, but it's as much as 15,000 for statewide uh, candidates to have to collect signatures, and, and that's really... Is the bar that high in other states? They, well, some other states, um, th their ballot access laws are completely different. In some states, Florida, for example, where I want to be a snowbird when I grow up, so I've been spending winters down there, and people can pay it's a couple thousand dollars and run for governor. That's all they have to do is pay a filing fee and run. We have to collect 
thousands of signatures, of signatures uh, or 1,500 in this case, yeah, in six weeks, in, uh, that, in that narrow six-week window. Now, uh, uh, New, New Jersey, it's, I think, $120 to file. Right. Now, Chris, even, even if the bar were lower in terms of getting signatures, um, you have a particular quarrel with the situation in Suffolk County in that it's uh, really difficult for uh, anyone that isn't uh, endorsed by the machine to get any votes at all. Is that correct? Well, uh, in this case, uh, the, uh, you could call it the machine, but the, the major parties are going to be nominating the same three candidates for countywide office. And so we're going to have a Soviet-style ballot, uh, but for the Libertarian uh, ballot. Uh, the Libertarian ballot line will be different. Uh, but the major parties being the Republicans, the Democrats, the conservatives, the working families, and the uh, independent uh, the party, the uh, or independence party, uh -huh. uh, which purports to be independent, uh, it has is not <laughs> is not being independent in this case. They're nominating the same uh, the same candidates as the Republicans. Okay, so the um, the office of district attorney, office of treasurer, and the office of um, <coughs> sheriff. Sheriff. Um, each one of those you can vote for. I, any party you want, but it'll be the same candidate. The same on candidate, each party line, except for the libertarian. Except for the libertarian, which for me is reason enough to run. And how the heck do they manage that when you've got, say, the Working Families Party and the Conservative Party, which are about as different politically as they can be, and yet they are endorsing the same candidate? Well, perhaps these are very, very good people that they have won the unanimous approval of all the politicians. Well, in then, Suffolk. how dare you run against them, Mr. <laughs> Garvey? Well, there's this matter of wanting to give people choice. Right. Mm -hmm. Last last time, um, the last county executive race, there was one man running. The, he was a Democrat, but he he behaves in many ways as a Republican. And by the way, I like to call them the two older parties, Joe. I don't like to, you know, we're the fastest growing and the, the third largest party, but they're just the oldest parties. They may not be, if, actually, it's hard to tell the difference between the two of them, though, Joe. You know, I call them, he, Chris Republicans. calls them Republicans. Republicans, I call them Demopublicans, but it's really one party, it's the incumbent party when we really okay. analyze it. Well, for it. people who don't know, um, what are some of the principal differences between the Libertarian Party, the Democrat Party, the Republican Party, and so on? Well, uh, I think, you know, personal freedom is one thing, I think the Libertarians okay. and maybe the, de the Democrats would agree on. Economic freedom is something that Libertarians believe in and the Republicans might agree in. So, you know, there are many overlaps, but our, we're true, uh, you know, th through uh, social and political uh, issues because we believe that the individual should have the right to decide for him or herself that government does not know better how to take care of our health or what, what we should eat or what we should smoke or uh, what time to go to bed and do we need to take vitamins or take an umbrella with us when we go outside. I mean, that's... Or the, or the size of the vitamin pill you right now, uh, Or trans are, fat for right, that matter. Exactly. There are a lot of misconceptions <laughs> out there about what libertarians are and what we stand for. And um, Chris, what are some of the major objections that you hear to libertarianism and how do you counter them? Uh, Liber who? Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's a big one. That's a big one. Um, uh, libertines. Uh, the, uh, Lyndon uh, LaRouche. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, people are too free. People. Uh, yeah, that's people, the one that yeah. I hear all the time. Yeah. People are too free. Yeah. A lot of people um, mistrust and fear liberty. Yeah, they're afraid the other guy is not going to handle liberty as responsibly well, as they are, or perhaps they're afraid the other guy is not going to handle liberty any better than they would. Or they're afraid that they themselves will not handle liberty. Mm. For example, when I was out petitioning recently, uh, I would always approach smokers because I would say, don't you want to vote for a candidate who's going to repeal the tobacco taxes? And sometimes that struck a chord with them, and sometimes they would say, no, I'm glad we're being taxed so heavily. I'm going to quit next week. Yeah, right. <laughs> the nanny state, then. Yeah, but a lot of people apparently enjoy the nanny state. They appreciate it. They prefer it that way. If uh, you believe that uh, marijuana is, should be illegal, how long do you think you should go to jail for your marijuana habit? Uh, uh, that's uh, your tobacco that, that's habit. a question I've actually asked somebody who said, oh, yeah, I like the fact that it's illegal, but I smoke it anyway. Uh -huh. um, 
it, it's a hard thing to, to reconcile. Well, Audrey, how do you counter that uh, when somebody gives you that kind of reasoning? Is there anything you can do besides just walk away or punch them? <laughs> <laughs> no, Joe, that, those are the two choices, no. No, the, the, those are no, choices I, I tend not to take. I don't think they're, no. I don't think they're productive. <laughs> no, but it takes, it, it takes time to educate the public. It takes, you know, we, we always used to talk about the minimum wage, for example, and we would say that um, these minimum wage laws actually hurt people, especially young people, and they go, what do you mean, what do you mean? And I said, well, let's raise it to $25 an hour then. Let's just give everybody 20 Oh, no, you can't do that. All right, say you have a yeah, Because no one would be able to get a job. Right. right? That, that, no, because, that, uh, because then $50 would be the going rate. That's hmm. what you'd need to live on if we, if we gave everybody to Well, there's that, so, yeah. But uh, if, if you owned a little deli or a grocery store and the school bus for the middle school was stopped right in front of your building and the kids were out there for half an hour and you see one energetic young man, you'd say, look, son, if you, if you sweep the sidewalk here while you're here for 15 minutes waiting for the bus and you do it again at 3 o'clock, I'll pay you $5 or whatever. You uh -huh. know? So the kid is happy to do it and the cops would be arresting both of you, you and the child for doing this. You're taking advantage. But where else is that child going to get the opportunity to earn that kind of money? And when people think about that, they go, oh yeah, Really, you, you're keeping somebody from getting a job instead of, you know, exactly. helping the economy and helping young people. Well, you know, they'd also get you the child labor. Right. right. Well, and another objection to libertarianism I hear that I feel is unjustified is I uh, have people saying to me, well, libertarians believe that if you see somebody drowning in the <laughs> lake, you shouldn't, you shouldn't pull him out. That's uh, no, that's, that, that's, that's not, not the case. Not uh, you should not force someone else at gunpoint to jump in and right. pull him out. But you, should, uh, you, you certainly uh, ought to do it yourself right? if and you can swim. That's, that's what I have to tell people, that it's not that you well, may no, have a moral the, imperative the yourself. Well, the issue but, no, is let, the let me take the voluntary nature of it, though. I mean, I am a good swimmer, but it's a, if a 400-pound man was drowning out there, I may not take the chance, but I would certainly throw him a ring or I would get a, a rowboat or something like that. I would certainly call the first thing to call, call for help. But... Uh, no, but but somebody can't come along and force me. Hey, you're a good swimmer. Get out there and do it. That I have the right to make the choice. Okay. Uh, and uh, but as a uh, as a sailing instructor, I often tell people, don't jump in the water to right. rescue the person because then you have two people in the water, and it's going to be that much harder to get everybody out. It's right. just like the airline say when the oxygen thing comes down. You put it on yourself before you help a child. You help yourself before you can help someone else. That's just common sense. Okay. Now, Chris, you are, a, uh, you are an attorney, so you would be certainly qualified for the uh, post of district attorney. Um, tell me a little bit about what the district attorney's office would look like under your administration. What would happen? Well, the, the first priority is to protect the innocent. And that's something that sometimes prosecutors forget. They think they're there to get convictions. There are some prosecutors who b believe that the rate of convictions is somehow their political qualification. The first job of the district attorney is to make sure that innocent people are not being thrown in jail. And so uh, that, that goes before anything else. Now, uh, the next step is to see that, uh, that the district attorney's resources are being used properly. I'm told, and I don't have a way to verify it yet, uh, that there's a, an old gentleman who uh, uh, may have been uh, making uh, uh, unfriendly gestures at his uh, neighbor who had been harassing him, and so she charged him with harassing her. And he, he claims the district attorney has spent about a million dollars prosecuting him. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, that's, that's his side of the story. Um, there's the Tankliff case where Marty Tankliff was, was uh, confronted with a, a false uh, statement by his uh, unconscious father. Uh, his father never regained consciousness, never made any statements, but the detective told Marty Tankliff that his father had said that Marty had killed the father. And uh, Marty said, uh, could I have blacked out? That was his confession. And there was a lot of very uh, irregular stuff in that right. investigation. Eventually, Marty Tancliffe was acquitted. But our present DA... After many years in after jail. After many years in jail. But, but your point basically is that district attorneys often 
will strive too hard just to get a conviction mm -hmm. rather than to see that justice is done, yeah. which are not always the same thing. Yeah, and uh, sometimes to cover up their mistakes or the mistakes of their predecessor. <laughs> right. Uh, and this is not the way the DA's office should be handled. Uh, now, there are many people who say that the present DA is a very good guy, a, a, a caring and uh, mm -hmm. compassionate uh, man, and, and he may well be. And, right. uh, uh, but uh, but the he's Tankliff been endorsed thing is, by too many parties. <laughs> well, there's that, and the Tankliff case is a little disturbing to me. Okay, now, Audrey, um, I want to get away from the um, uh, questions about the treasurer, because as you say, there's um, not you're running more to give a choice than because there's a, a libertarian way of being treasurer. However, you are an educator and libertarians have a great deal to say about education. Maybe you could enlighten our viewers a little bit about the libertarian approach to education and how it ought to be implemented. Well, I think that um, most libertarians would, first of all, we have to get back to whose, ch whose children are these? Uh, do they, uh, does the state own them or do the parents own them? I believe the parents own them. I believe the parents, not own them, but should be making choices for them until they're old enough to make their own choices. And if parents want to home school or if parents want to place their children in charter schools, it's really up to the parents. It's not up for, to the state to decide what the curriculum should be. That's historically up to the parents, and it should continue to be. Um, think of different needs or different places. We, I happen to live on Long Island in Suffolk County. We have water all around us, beaches uh, on the ocean, on the bays, on the sound. Perhaps I as a parent or my community thinks that all children should learn how to swim. Well, then we should be teaching them how to swim. We're, a, a family in Minnesota may not have that need, but the parents are the ones that ought to be deciding what the curriculum is. and who's going to teach their children and what they're going to teach their children. And, um, okay. And uh, do you feel that um, uh, they have a proprietary interest in their children that um, goes beyond anything that the, uh, the, the government might, might have in them? Definitely. Okay. Uh, now that's the question that a lot of people ask me and I sometimes find it, I have to admit, hard to answer. They say, well, you libertarians believe that man has no property in man, but what about parental authority over children? That is a proprietary interest, is it not? And how, do, how does a libertarian address that, that question? Well, it, it, it's nature too, Joe. I mean, if you have these children, it's your responsibility to, to educate them. I mean, most, most of the time, the parents who do educate their children at home the children score, you know, way much higher on standardized tests than the average child. For example, uh, would a, um, according to the libertarian point of view, would a, would it be all right for a parent to just refuse to educate their child, refuse to take to well, send it to that, school that's, or homeschool it? That's homeschool a sticky it? question. But um, how many parents have you ever seen who've not, done that? It, yeah, it's against nature. I, I, I can't even. Um, Imagine that happening. And Chris, from a legalistic point of view, um, where does por how far does parental authority go? And from a libertarian perspective, how far should it go? Hmm. Who? Um, yeah, that you've seen an awful lot of abuse by our current state, which thinks in many cases they believe uh, they know better than the parent how the child should be raised. Uh, and in very few circumstances that may be true, but for the most part parents have a greater interest in their children than anyone else. And in fact, studies have shown genetically that you are much, uh, much less likely to murder your own children than anyone else's. And uh, the closer you are related to those children, the less you are uh, likely to murder them, which is a very good thing since children seem to work very hard at wanting to be, at making themselves uh, the objects of uh, urges to kill by their parents. <laughs> um, but uh, so I, I would tend to trust the parents more than anyone else and it has to be a pretty, uh, a pretty poor parent to require Okay, as district attorney, what would your attitude be towards prosecution of domestic abuse cases? Uh, that's a different question. Uh, domestic abuse, as it's currently being handled in Suffolk County, uh, the police have no discretion. If domestic abuse is alleged, 
Uh, the prosecution, the mechanism of prosecution seems to be uh, engaged and someone has to get arrested. Uh -huh. And uh, Does the same hold true for like child services if there's an import, a report of child abuse of some kind? I'm not sure how much discretion is given there. Um, the, uh, I think the pendulum has swung too far in that direction and that uh, judgment and discretion have been taken out of the equation completely. Mm -hmm. And this means that a person who's willing to lie and make false police reports can make their uh, estranged spouse's life a, uh, a series of arrests and uh, jailings. Right. And, and uh, from an educational perspective, uh, Audrey, I'm very <laughs> disturbed by these uh, the constant talk about zero tolerance policies, which mm -hmm. I find lead to just extraordinarily stupid actions on the part mm -hmm. of uh, school administrators. Uh, what, would a, what would a libertarian solution be to that sort of nonsense? Well, you can't legislate common sense, unfortunately, Joe, but I mean, th th it's gone to an extreme. In some cases, a kindergarten child who draws a picture of a gun is expelled from school or a child coming in. Well, I'd have been institutionalized <laughs> long ago if that were the case. <laughs> it's the truth. I mean, it's really happening in, in this country where a, a young child drew, drew a picture of a gun and said bang, bang, and that was it. He was expelled from school uh, because of the zero tolerance uh, policy. And I have zero tolerance for that policy, Joe. How did we because get to that point? I, it's, it's, foolishness, it's extreme, it's trying to bend over backwards to meet people's needs. But, I mean, I heard a story from a, a fellow teacher who um, has children coming in from foreign, foreign, con foreign countries speaking different languages, and the child, they, they don't have the money to buy the school lunch, so they bring their lunch from home, and a little girl opened up her lunch and got a paring knife out to cut the apple or the pear that the mother had provided in the lunch. They're fresher that way, aren't they? It was a knife. It was a, it was a uh, weapon, and, and she was... Uh, hauled off in handcuffs, I yes, suppose. Yes, oh, yes. She might not have been handcuffed, but she was removed from the premises and went through hearings. And I mean, it's so ridiculous. When my, my uh, aunt and my father were going to school, every child had a pen knife attached to his or her belt. They would they would whittle things, they would carve things, they would do mumbling. Oh, sure. uh, they would make marble outlines to, to pl play marbles. I mean, we have Oh, that stuff made went on all the time, and there was no, viol Joe, no actual violence. Worse than that, it, children at lunchtime, at recess time, may not engage in baseball with wooden or aluminum bats. They can only use wiffle balls and plastic bats, and this is the American pastime. Baseball is outlawed yeah. in recess well, in public Chris, schools. Chris, how, how do you think we got to such a state? Well, I, th I, I think uh, the, the weaponry thing is part of this gun phobia, which, uh, which the anti-gun people would like to uh, promulgate. And how do you feel about the right to keep and bear arms, and what's the libertarian stand well, on that? Well, the libertarian view is that we have a right to keep and bear arms, and the reason for that right to bear, bear arms was uh, graphically illustrated in the 20th century, uh, during which there were only 18 million private murders, uh, murders worldwide committed by individuals and, and gangs. Uh, generally, they're committed with the human body. Uh, the next uh, most popular weapon is a bludgeon. Way behind that is knives, uh, mm -hmm. a knife, and uh, way behind that is uh, is guns. And um, so, uh, you compare that to 120 million people killed by their own governments outside of war. Uh, depending on how you count the numbers. Okay, so as, as district attorney, I imagine you would be pretty uh, reluctant to prosecute people for mere possession of, of firearms. That would not be my top priority. Okay, and um, neither would uh, drug use, I take it. Uh, that's correct. Are there certain crimes that you feel are given a low priority these days that you would give a much higher priority to? Yes, fraud. 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 It, fraud is complicated. Fraud is hard to detect. Fraud is hard to deal with. Fraud is hard to build a paper trail for. Um, uh, but uh, it's a very popular way to make money nowadays. And uh, it's, uh, uh, people are getting away with it. And I'd, I'd like to, uh, you know, very often it's considered, well, you know, this is just a matter of contract. Uh, you made a contract with this guy and uh, he didn't keep his contract, so sue him. Okay. Uh,
All right. Now, uh, Audrey, from an educational point of view, what are some of the, the basic principles that you can teach a child about libertarianism and have the kid say, yes, I understand that, I, I agree with it, that's a very good principle? What are some of the very basics you want to teach them? Oh, that's a good question. But um, <clears throat> we, have a, we have a little thing called a Nolan chart, and many of the, um, the, the questions or the uh, issues that are on there I have given to children. Um, give me a minute and I'll think some of the exact issues. But one of them was about the child, um, you know, the minimum wage law. But children, oh, thank you, Chris. He has one here for me right well, here. Well, children tend to be very authoritarian in their outlook, well, don't they? Well, whenever I give this to children and to large groups of children, they fall in the libertarian quadrant. Really? Children, I think what you might be referring to is that Sometimes a, a school or even a class will have a like a jury type of thing, and then the children are usually are more uh, s dictatorial in their in their meeting out of punishment than than the faculty may have been. Children do tend to to mm -hmm. go this way, but you know when you talk to them about guns is one thing. Um, yeah. You know, should people have a right? Is the Second Amendment right. really there, or or is it? They agree with that. Minimum wage law, right. taxes, pay for services with right. user fees. Okay. Children agree now, with all of those Okay, things. fine. Now, um, Chris, I'd like to ask you, um, what is the libertarian approach to criminal justice? Um, you know, punishing criminals. Do we gen generally advocate capital punishment, imprisonment, or some sort of alternate punishment? Restitution? I don't know that there's a libertarian position on that. Capital punishment you have to be a little wary of. Mm. Uh, you should probably not trust your government to kill people because very often they'll wind up killing those they perceive as their enemies. And look at that experience in the 20th century. With only 18 million private murders, how did they justify killing 120 million people? Well, some of them were killed because they were Armenians. Some were killed because they were opponents of Joe Stalin. Some were killed because they were from the wrong social class or too intellectual. Uh, so government tends to make up crimes as they go along for the purpose of getting rid of people they find inconvenient or uh, unacceptable. And that is something to keep in mind very much as we uh, approach Election Day 2009 and every election thereafter, that uh, we may love our country, but we have to fear our government. And uh, on that note, I want to thank you both, Audrey Capozzi and Chris Garvey, for showing up. And uh, thank you for tuning in. And join us next week for another edition of Hardfire.